Acts chapter 17. I want to read a few verses for you, verse 26 through 28. I'm going to try. <laughs> and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Let's say amen to the reading of God's word. Now, before you take your seat, I want you to help me out with the title of today's message. And at first, you, you, it might, might seem an odd title, for the passage that I've read thus far, but in time, shortly, it, it'll, it'll make sense, I promise. And I know as well that it might seem to be a negative statement, but it's really not, it's positive. I want you to look at someone and I want you to say it like this. I want you to emphasize it, look at them and say, we can't do it. Tell somebody else the same. We can't do it. We can't. We can't. We can't do it. You may be seated. We can't do it. We can't. Wait a minute now. Did not the scripture say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Yes. But in a world where it seems like any and everything goes, there are some things that we can't do. There are some things that we mustn't do. Sadly, many present day so-called Christians have something in common with unbelievers. While they talk fluent Christianese, mm -hmm, their walk says something entirely different. They appear to be connected to Jesus Christ, the true vine. However, they bear no real fruit. Mm -hmm. Stay with me, saints. These people know about God in their heads, but not in their hearts. Consequently, they honor the Lord with their lips, but their hearts are distant and detached. Jesus put it this way, Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, the Passion Translation presents it this way. Frauds and hypocrites. Isaiah described you perfectly when he said, these people honor me only with their words, for their hearts are so very distant from me. They pretend to worship me. But their worship is nothing more than the empty traditions of men. Somebody say, God help us. God help us. God help us. Uh, the backdrop of, of, of today's text, the context for the content. Uh, in Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 21, we find Paul in uncharted uh, territory. Uh, he's in Athens. It's the first Greek city he's visited, and he is deeply disturbed by the things that he observes. He sees idolatry on steroids. He splits his time between the synagogue filled with Jews as well if, as some um, God-fearing Gentiles uh, who worship the Jewish God in the marketplace or the public square, uh, and, and he's there, uh, excuse me, he's in the synagogues and in the public square, the marketplace, with the Athenian philosophers. <clears throat> they find him and they're engaged in conversations. Although they have a sense of, uh, of uh, um, wisdom 
in that which the philosophers speak and we're noted for speaking, uh, they're not the smartest. Do you know some dumb, smart people? Uh, I know some dumb, smart people. I mean, they seem to be degreed and they are highly intelligent sounding, but just dumb, just, just stupid, just, just, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You remember the fool said in his heart, there is no God. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, we find uh, Paul here uh, in what's called the Areopagus, the, Areo, the Areopagus or, or Mars Hill. The Areopagus is a location, but it also speaks of the Athenian council or court. And uh, they are there, and they're having some discussions. And so we see later in the passage, verses 23 through 24, uh, Paul uh, is connecting with culture, proving Jewish history and apologetics are not his only skill. Paul was multi-talented. He shows how the religious customs of the Athenians or of Athens, um, even using their own poets to bring about uh, truths to point them not to himself, but to Jesus Christ. He preaches Jesus Christ and he preaches the resurrection. They see it, however, as a foreign god, not uh, embraced or authorized by Rome, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, uh, really, it's a crime. Uh, but they're engaged with him. They 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 enjoy hearing uh, his words and having debates with them. And so he is there, and some believe, but then others reject this Christ and resurrection. In fact, they saw it as him preaching to gods new gods, Jesus, and a God called resurrection, not just Jesus being resurrected. And so uh, when reading and studying this ancient text, I could not help but see similarities today. I believe that there is a word from the Lord for each of us today when we look at this passage that records Paul's experience long ago somewhere around 51 to 52 AD. I see in this passage at least, not an exhaustive list, at least four things we cannot do. Everybody say four things we cannot do. Somebody say preach, pre preach pastor, preach pastor, preach pastor. Four things. Encourage your brother, okay? Encourage your brother. Encourage your brother. Uh, so, um, uh, this world in which we live, this nation in which we live is very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. We must admit that we've seen a lot of crazy things happen over these last few years. A lot of crazy things. A lot of, a lot of crazy things going on. A lot of crazy things. Thinking about... Danny Glover in the movie Beloved. He walks up in the house and he said, got some strange things going on up in here. That's what I see in the world today. And sadly, I see it even in the house of God today. We got some strange things going on. But I believe that God handpicked every one of us for today. The fact that you are alive today is significant that you, like Esther in her day, are here for such a time as this. Talk to yourself and say, I'm supposed to be here. I'm, I'm, supposed, I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be here. I, I, I could have been here in the 1800s. You could have been here in the 1800s. Man, I'm glad I wasn't in the 1800s. I, something about indoor plumbing is just a blessing, y'all. Amen. You know, in the 1800s, you had to go out back. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm grateful. I'm, gr I'm grateful. I'm grateful today. 
Uh, but we've got some crazy things going on. The mindsets of people seems like there's such mental instability, the hatred in the land. Uh, what we're dealing with in the political arena, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. You know, um, I, I'm not here uh, to tell you as if I could um, who to vote for. But I encourage you to listen, to be informed, to go beyond just the words of the politicians. Because people will tell you what you want to hear just to get your vote. Uh-huh. You know, I, I watch the RNC, the Republican National Convention. I expect to watch the Democratic Convention because I want to be informed. I want to know. I want to know. And I, I, was, I was hopeful, truly hopeful, that uh, former President Donald Trump, that's right, I called his name. I was hopeful after you had a bullet whiz by your ear. I said, okay, I'm going to look past that big bandage on your... I don't, I don't know, I don't know, because I'm not a medical professional, but I had never seen that before. Like, what in the world? I, I, I don't know. But I'm going to trust that since your life flashed by, by, past you, I'm, I'm going to trust that what I've been hearing thus far, that you're going to unify the nation, that we're going to have it. And so I listened. I listened while he was reading from the teleprompter. And then when he shifted, I said, time's up. It was, it was, it was the color purple now. Oh. Close the piano and let me get out of here. I said, I am going to bed because I don't want to hear this rhetoric. I don't, I don't want to hear that. Our nation doesn't need rhetoric. We, we need revival. And I don't look to the po politicians for, for revival. But I know what we need to do is we need to pray for all who are, who are in authority. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, we, we, this is not the time for us to be playing. Not playing with life, not playing church, not playing with faith. This is time for us to, uh, uh, to be authentic in, in our convictions. Do we have convictions? I'm, I'm disturbed by, 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 by what I see. Uh, uh, you know, I, I thank God for being brought up uh, in, a, in, in a time um, uh, when real music was filling the radio stations. I was wondering where I was going, huh? Yeah, yo, I'm talking about real music, all right. And I ain't talking about uh, Andre Crouch right now. Um, but, you know, you, you know, don't act like you've been saved all your life and you ain't never listened. And some of y'all got Soul Town on your radio now. We was listening to Temptations on the way here. Don't mess with me. I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, but again, God has us here for a purpose. There are some things that we should do, but then there's some things that we mustn't do. And, and, and that's my focus today from the text. The first thing, and I want you to help me with this, tell your neighbor, we can't be indifferent. Indifferent. Taking notes, come on, write it down. We can't be indifferent. We can't be apathetic. We cannot be unmoved. Acts chapter 17, verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them who, um, Silas and Timothy, in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. Paul was in an, a city where idolatry was the norm. It was common. It was culture. It was the way they viewed life. It was the way they did life. 
Paul, seeing it, was agitated. Uh, one, uh, one writer talks about him being overwhelmed. Uh, 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 he was disgusted. He was grieved by the idolatry he observed in the land. Well, we can look down our noses at the Athenians and those of others for their idolatry, but we got some idolatry going on in America right now. It's just masked. It's just presented differently. Paul was troubled by what he saw. What's troubling you? What's bother, bothering you? There are things now that don't bother us that should trouble us. There are, they, come on, you know it. There, 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 there are jokes that you, you wouldn't laugh at years ago. But now you're telling those jokes. There are words that you would not say. Having received Jesus Christ, you, 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 you would watch your speech so that your communication would be pure. And, 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 and I know it, it's sad that we got some cussing preachers now. I was taught that saints ought not to cuss profanity. But when you hear even cussing from the pulpit, it just suggests, well, I guess that's just the way you do it. You got to be able to speak the language of the people. I don't see anywhere. Don't think for a moment that cussing is a 21st century phenomenon. They was cussing in Jesus' time. But Jesus wasn't using profanity. Are we not supposed to walk like Christ? Uh-oh, it's getting tight in here. Somebody's getting nervous. You done cussed somebody out yesterday and let mm -hmm. Lord Jesus, God reading your mail today, amen. Mm -mm. Should, shouldn't, shouldn't cuss. Let your words be seasoned with grace. Seasoned with salt that it might minister grace to the hearers. Tell your neighbor, don't get nervous. He ain't talking about you. Not, not, your, not your holy self. He not talking about you. He ain't talking about you. What, what, what's troubling you? Considering all that's going on in the world, is there nothing troubling us? Do we sit idly by and just go along with everything that's being said and everything that's being done when we observe the idolatry in the land? Are we not grieved? Paul was grieved by what grieved the Holy Spirit. What I'm saying to you today is that we should be grieved by that which grieves the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 63, verse 9 and 10. In all their afflictions, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he re redeemed them. And he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy and fought against them. Isaiah mentions the grievance of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being grieved. Well, Paul picks it up in Ephesians 4 and 30 and says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by which you were sealed for the day of redemption. And interestingly, when you read that verse in context, it's connected to your mouth, your conversation, and your conduct. Today, folk talk about people like it's nothing. I know they've been talking about people since they could talk. But there was a difference among believers. They, 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 they would shut you down. Uh, that's one of the things that was said about Lauren's grandmother, that uh, 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 she, 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 she wasn't going along with that. She said, oh, no, 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 don't, don't, mm -mm. And that's what the saints of old used to do now. But the saints of new don't even see it as wrong. Gossip? Okay, you don't smoke, you don't drink. And I guess, you, you know, um, what, what is chewing snuff is, is, is definitely old school list of sin. So you don't, you don't do that. But you gossip? You talk about people? You complain about everything? You criticize? just for the sake of criticism, but you're, you're not bothered by it, and it's grieving the Holy Spirit. Fact of the matter is, 
when you walk with the Lord, you really don't need anybody like me or, or anyone else for that matter to tell you what's wrong. Because when you're truly saved, when you met Jesus Christ, when he lives in you, how many of you know the Holy Ghost will check you? It suggests that some folk who say they have the Holy Spirit don't really have the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will check you. And you, ain't, you, you haven't been checked until the Holy Ghost check you. He will convict or convince of righteousness, sin, and judgment. The Holy Spirit, while you framing the words you're about to say, will tell you, don't go there. Sh shut your mouth. Turn the other cheek. Don't do that. You waiting for deep revelations. I want God to show me this. He's showing you right now how to save your life by shutting your mouth. He, he will tell you, delete that contact. Uh oh, just went from here down there. Mm -hmm. He will tell you, don't bother him. He will tell you, don't bother, no, don't mess with her. Yeah. When you're walking with the Lord, he gives you choice. So even though he speaks, you may decide to disobey. And therefore you grieve the, the Holy Spirit. He can be grieved just like, like you can be grieved. Don't, don't try to give us the impression that you are never grieved. We know you're saved. We believe it. We ain't judging you. But there's, there's times, some folk, seasons, where you can be more irritable than other times. Uh -huh. Some of y'all want me to hurry up and get to the conclusion because you have not eaten since 7 a.m., Mm-hmm. So it causes your level of irritability to increase. Not to mention your feet may be hurting because they had me standing for 20 minutes. You're hungry. Somebody broke. That'll make you irritable. Uh -huh. So you can be grieved because you're a person. When we speak of the person, of the Holy Spirit, he can be grieved. Let's not grieve him. The Greek word for grieve here in Ephesians 4 and 30 means to cause to feel sorrow, pain, unhappiness, or distress. When we look at the things that are going on in our world, when we look at things that are going on even in his church, it ought to cause something to be stirred on the inside of us. Today, saints, we must be grieved by what grieves the Holy Spirit. Paul looked at the Athenians and was grieved by their idolatry. And say this with me, idolatry is sin. Mm -hmm. Idolatry is sin. How can you say that, pastor? Well, I can say it because the word says it. I'm authorized to say it because the word says it. Most of us, most of us, if we've not heard about the Ten Commandments, we know the Ten Commandments, or at least one or two of them. And every one of us, in some way or another, have broken one or more of the commandments. Truth be told, mm -hmm, truth be told, uh -huh, I, I, just get them on the screen right now. Show, show us the person. Show us the person who then broke the commandments. Not me. Get me off the... Backfired. <laughs> Should have thought that one through. <laughs> and God spoke, Exodus 20, verses 1 through 6, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above 
or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Idolatry is sin. The Athenians were full of idols, or, or, or inundated rather with idols. The people were steeped deeply in idolatry. Idolatry refers to uh, worshiping idols, images, or other substitutions for the one and only true God. Paul describes the origin of idolatry in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 25, noting men forsook God and sank into ignorance and moral corruption. The most common forms of idolatry are this, not an exhaustive list, but the most common forms are the worship of trinkets, statues, or images of God. Uh, the worship of trees, rivers, hills, stones, uh -huh, for their imagined spiritual or magical powers. Uh, this is called fetishism. Then there's the worship of nature, the sun, the moon, the stars, as supreme powers of nature. There's also the, the, the worship of heroes, sheroes, or deceased ancestors. Mm -hmm. Tell your neighbor, but that ain't all, that ain't all. Tim Keller in his book, Counterfeit Gods, writes, an idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, and anything you seek to give you what only God can give. Today, most people don't explicitly bow down to carved images or statues. Modern day idolatry at its core is the worship of self. We worship at the altar of our pride and ego. We worship, turn the mic up, y'all, turn the mic we, we worship at the altar of materialism, which feeds our need to build our egos through the acquisition of more stuff. We worship at the altar of self-aggrandizement and self-indulgence. We idolize and worship humankind through naturalism and science, believing the illusions that suggest we are lords of ourselves and ultimately lords of the, of the world and its systems. First John 5 and 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Amen. We cannot be indifferent. God help us to be stirred, to be provoked like Paul was when he observed the idolatry in the land. And then the second thing we cannot do, look at your neighbor please and say, we can't be silent. Mm -hmm. Tell somebody else it's time for you to raise your voice. I know when we hear the term raising your voice, many of us are taken back a bit when uh, perhaps we, we, we said something uh, and it was usually the mamas that would respond this way. Don't you raise your voice to me. Don't you, bet, you better remember who you're talking to. Don't you raise your voice, which suggests that your tone was not where it needed to be. And if you heard that from your mother, you knew that you were about one moment away from waking up a day later. Mm -hmm. Talking about what happened, what happened, what happened. Mm -hmm. You forgot who you were talking to. Mm -hmm. And she, she checked you so quickly you didn't even hear I brought you in this world and I can take you out. Next thing you know. She... Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to raise your, your voice in a positive sense is speaking loud enough 
for others to hear and to speak with clarity. Raise your voice in a way that reduces or avoids confusion or misunderstanding. It's time for you to use your voice to make a difference in the world. That's what Paul did. Paul raised his voice. Look at verse 17. Therefore, Paul reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace or the public square daily and with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some says, said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Sound like today. Folk just want to hear something new. If they don't want to hear about it. They want to talk about it. Paul reasoned with them. That is, he debated with them. Uh, one translation says he argued with them. Not in the sense like you get in an argument with yourself. I started to say spouse. Uh, not no. He's 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 reasoning, debating, arguing his point, arguing in proclamation of the gospel. Now these. Philosophers, and when you study history, um, you'll know that during this time, philosophy was a big thing. A big, that's why uh, you, when you hear Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 say that my preaching and teaching is not with enticing words of wan, man's wisdom. He's talking about the philosophies and the philosophers who were presenting their opinions and their ideas and their thoughts about life and, and, and the things of life and, and, and the things uh, that uh, uh, would be beyond themselves to their imaginations about the heavens and, 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 and the God or the gods, as they would say. He says, no, I don't, I don't, I don't come to you with that, but I come to you in demonstration of the spirit and power so that your faith may not be in man, but in the power of God. The, the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers uh, were, were, were two, um, two of the main Hellenistic uh, schools of philosophy at the time. And while differing in their fundamental beliefs or tenets, uh, they, they recognize uh, the, the goal of philosophy to be the transformation of self into a sage, a sage that being one who attained a plentitude of being or perfection uh, a, in, in state of being. Uh, basically, you, uh, 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 Lord, help me get it out. Epicureanism teaches to arrange one's life in such a way that is completely free of pain and stress, including the stress brought about by your over indulgence and pleasure seeking. Uh, some have thought that the Epicurean philosophy uh, lent itself also to hedonism, hedonism rather, hedonism, um, uh, where just kind of do, just do whatever you want to do, just seek pleasure, etc. But more, more, Contemporary thought is that that really wasn't the issue. It was kind of just getting to a place where you, you're living without the stress and the sorrows and the troubles of life, that you come to this place of just wonderful bliss here in life. Stoicism, on the other hand, emphasizes rationalism and logic. Logos uh, teaches that uh, one should align uh, their, their expectations with the natural law of the cosmos and not to worry about the rest. Be happy, don't worry. They called Paul a babbler. And this word, I looked it up, babbler, uh, it really uh, meant a seed picker. And there was a, a bird, in fact, uh, that's connected to the word that would go around and just pick up seeds. 
just randomly, whatever he saw, picked up. And a babbler was considered one that act like the bird and just picking up thoughts and ideas and just re-speaking those things randomly without order. So in Paul, who was very intelligent, Paul was highly intelligent. Paul knew how to debate, but they still called him a babbler because of what he said, not how he said it, but what he said. Well, I like this. Paul was not moved by their opinions of him. Uh, he was unmoved by their opinions and used his voice to proclaim the gospel. And we must be like Paul in this sense. People may say what you speak is stupid. It's stupidity. It's illogical. It makes no sense. It's old fashion. It should not be preached. It's so old school, it's antiquated. Uh, you, 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 should not, you should not be dogmatic in your preaching of Jesus Christ. Oh, okay, so he existed, but he is just one of many ways to salvation. And, and stop being closed-minded. Stop being narrow-minded. That's what people will tell you. But you've got to be on point like Paul, that we've got to say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the so-called gospel that people present now. You, you know, there are folk that have itching ears. Paul spoke of them in times past. They exist today. They want to hear a message that's going to make them feel good. And so they will often go where they can get a message that makes them feel good. They don't want to hear anything that's going to convict them. They don't want to hear anything that's going to, uh, uh, going to address uh, uh, any sins in their lives. They, they, they don't want you to say anything that would object to or oppose their choice of life and lifestyle. They, 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 they don't want to hear anything like that. They don't, in some places, they don't even want you to mention the word sin. Don't you say, mm -mm -mm. you want to you keep preaching in this pulpit. You better not touch adultery. Mm-hmm. Especially when the deacon is messing around with the church mother. Now, you know that's real bad. Y'all thought I was going to say the choir director. Don't you touch that. Listen, we got to call sin what it is. It's not just a problem. It's not just your issue. It's not just your struggle. Sin is sin. And hear me. All unrighteousness is sin if, if I'm off track I want to know I'm off track if I need to be corrected I stand to be corrected if my ideas are Im improper or wrong I need to know because I don't want there to be anything between me and my God I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit I don't want to promote something that's not like God So if in my preaching the gospel, if in my teaching the word of God, you say, see you later, bro. I'm not coming back to hear that. I'm going to still declare what the word says. It says that we shouldn't lie, but speak the truth in love. It says we shouldn't steal, but we should work with our own hands. It says we should love and, and not hate. It says we should forgive. It says we should be merciful. It, the word teaches us that we shouldn't be racist. We shouldn't be prejudiced. I read today from one blood, he created all the nations. You're my brother, you're my sister. I don't care what the tone of your skin is, what your hue is. It does, doesn't matter, in Christ Jesus, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. That takes care of ethnicity. There's neither bond nor free. That takes care of the social dimension. There's neither male nor female. That takes care of anything that would separate us. We're one in Christ Jesus. We're one in Christ Jesus. 
We can't be silent. We can't be silent. We got to open up our mouth and we've got to speak. And we must do like Paul. Paul used his voice to proclaim the word of God. And we must with scriptural comprehension, confidence, and compassion declare the word of the Lord. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter 3, verse 15. Uh, uh, and 16, the New Living Translation says, instead you must worship God as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear that if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Simple. Have an answer. Theological term is have an apologetic, have a defense. Not, I'm sorry, that's not what an apologetic is uh, as far as uh, theology goes. It's, it's a defense, knowing why you believe what you believe. And in order to do that, that's why you got to be a student of the word. And you do it, you, you, you do it with confidence, you do it with compassion. You don't get into arguments with people over this, that, and the other. But you can stand your ground and declare, I believe Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Why? Here's why. I believe he's the one that's sent from heaven. I believe that he's the way, the truth, and the life. I believe there's one road to, 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 to heaven, and that's the way, Jesus the Christ. I believe based upon the word of God. You don't, you don't fall out with the, with the Muslim or fall out with the... Uh, with the Jehovah Witness or, or with the Mormon, you know the truth and know it so that when they speak to you of what they believe, confidently communicated, that you can show them, no, 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 that's not the way. No, 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 Jesus was not a created being. No, 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 Jesus was not a, a small G God. Jesus was not Michael the archangel incarnate. Oh, the devil is a liar. You got to know that. You got to know that. And you got to show them. You got to show them. Now, they wanna make, might want to fight back with you, but in your reasoning, be so, be so, be so uh, aware of what's truth that when the counterfeit shows up, you recognize it. Know God's word so that when all of a sudden you hear, oh, you know what? what, who we thought was the Messiah wasn't the Messiah. The Messiah has come now. He's down there in Australia. And next thing you know, you're spending all your money trying to get down under. No, Jesus said in the last times you're going to hear, hold him aside. No, no, no. You don't have to look for another. He's already come. What we look for is his soon return. We cannot be silent. The third thing, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. The third thing, help me look at your neighbor and say, we can't be religious. Uh, we can't be religious. Look at verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. In the classical King James Version, it uses the word superstition, uh, superstitious. But superstitious is not the best translation. The best translation is religious, very religious, or pious. That's what the word means. Uh, uh, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. See, in Athens, they had gods for everything, just multiple gods. And... So as not to leave any God out, they had an idol with the inscription to the unknown God or to an unknown God. And Paul seizes this opportunity and says, the one whom you worship without knowing, I proclaim him now to you. Let me help you see. Let me help you know. Let me help you to get to know this one you don't know. Uh, so um, Paul is literally talking about all the idols, perceiving that the people were greatly addicted to the worship of invisible powers. Religious folk are problematic. I got a problem with religious folk. You should have a problem with religious folk. Not just outside the household of faith, but inside. 
Don't give them an answer, but just look at somebody and say, are you religious? <laughs> you ain't going to admit that right now. You're pious. You, you dress the part, mostly. You speak the part. You, you may even speak in little tongues. Shando. He's coming in a Honda. Eat a mosquito. Hondalay, Hondalay. <laughs> They're known and unknown tongues. <laughs> um, you, you may have a big family edition Bible in your living room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but do you really know God? Or are you just religious? And I contend that there are a lot of religious folk who claim to be Christians. But bottom line is you're just religious. You put on your religious Christian garb and you come to the church house at least once every two months. You celebrate Christmas. You celebrate Easter, Resurrection Sunday, and Mother's Day. There is a purity about you. You don't, you don't defile the temple. You don't drink anything stronger than Jamaican ginger ale. You don't cuss on Sundays. You know Psalm 23. But do you know the God of Psalm 23? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, uh. Matthew, Matthew 23, oh Lord. Let me finish Matthew. Matthew 23, verses, let's start with verse 1. Jesus said to the crowds and to his, discipline, his disciples, rather, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. Whatever truth they see, they speak, you, you, you identify with that. But don't follow their example, though, because they're hypocrites. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes and scripture verses inside or with scripture verses inside. And they wear, they wear robes with extra long tassels and they love to sit on the head table at banquets in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi. Sound like today. Sound like today, y'all. There are people who are leaders. They're dressed down. I'm going to say this, and I'm, I'm going to say this, and I'm grateful. Let me preface it with this. I'm grateful for those men and women that God used to teach me the way of Christ, to point me to him. But even among them, I saw some things that grieved my spirit. Like, why are we in full motion praising the Lord? Have you tried Jesus? He's all right. God is a good God. Hey, saints is bucking and shouting. Uh oh, the bishop is here. Stop the service. Everybody stand. Now we got to stand for the bishop who was late to the church service. Bishop, you late. Maybe you got a good reason, bishop, for being late. Too often it was because the bishop was in the back bishop's office. The service is underway. We're worshiping God. I got to stop my worship and it's called to honor and listen, give honor to whom honor is due. But something wrong with that. This ain't about you, bishop. 
We got to stop service so you, Bishop, can go and sit in your high chair. Everybody else is shouting and praising God, and, and, and you just sitting there like, like, like your breath don't stink. And I was determined, I'm not going to be that one. Oh, no, 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 no. Because I saw some wonderful examples as well of folk who had titles, who said, I'm not going to let my title have me in a space of ignorance. But I'm going to show the people that the bishop ought to praise the Lord, that the apostle ought to bow before the Lord that the prophet ought to shut up prophesying for a moment and give praise to God. That the deacon, the deacon, the deacon is not the one to rule the church. The deacon should lead like everybody else. You're not somebody greater because you a deacon. The deacon ought to praise God. The deacon ought to know God. The church mother, my God, I, I, I'm so disturbed when folks spend thousands of dollars on their convention garments you so dressed up now you can't praise God because you want to break a heel you you don't you you don't want to do too much movement because you don't want your hat to fall off took you about 15 minutes to get it set in place and God knows you don't want it to fall out fall off because your hair will be messy. But I remember, I remember, I remember when the saints would come and they say, I'm not here for form or fashion. If I can't praise God with what I got on, I don't need to have it on. That when I come here, yes, look nice. It's okay to have your robes on. It's, it's, I'm not saying that you can't. But if you're going to have it on, don't let it get in the way of your praise. You ought to praise God like the saints said, till you get ugly. Some of us are just too cute. I just don't want to mess up my, don't want to give anybody the appearance that, that, that I'm, I'm ignorant. Which is a good segue to my last point. Would you tell somebody, we can't forget. Now they didn't hear you. Look at somebody else, shout it out and say, we can't forget. What is meant here? Paul says, you don't know this God, but I know him. Let me explain it to you. He is the God of the heavens. He's the God of the earth. He's the God that reached down to men not men trying to reach up to him but he said low in the volume of the book it's written to me i'm gonna go i'm gonna wrap myself in human flesh i'm gonna be the christ uh, the messiah come emmanuel god with us uh, to dwell among the people to show them the father and paul says listen uh, <laughs> you got an inscription and it says in him we live, move, and have our being. Well, maybe you didn't know what you was talking about, but the truth be told, in him we live, move, and have our being. Tell your neighbor, in him I live, move, and have my being. I, I wasn't gonna do this today, but I feel a preaching in my spirit. In him we live, move, and have our being you gotta know this you can't forget this that it was god almighty that saved you that raised you that delivered you that set you free that gave you life in the first place he's the giver and the sustainer of life i've come to recognize that in him i live move and have my being essentially means that i am absolutely dependent upon god i can't live without him 
I can't move without him. I do not exist without him. Call me a fool if you please, but I live every waking moment of the day knowing that it's in him I live. In him I move. In him I have my existence. Maybe you can go on in life and do you, but I can't live without him. I am conscious of this. I recognize this, that it was God who stepped down from heaven and hung on a cross at Calvary just for me. I was guilty as sin. Don't look at me like that, you too. Tell your neighbor I was guilty as sin, but he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. My righteousness, your righteousness was as filthy rags, but the righteousness of God now covers me. I'm saved by his power divine. I'm saved to new life sublime. I'm saved because of Jesus. I'm saved today, not because of the bishop, not because of the apostle, not because of the pope. I'm saved because of Jesus Christ, my high priest, the bishop and captain of my soul. I'm saved today and I can't forget that he is bread from heaven. He is water in a thirsty land. He is the alpha and omega. He is the first and the last. He is God of my salvation, soon coming king. He is my healer. By his stripes I'm healed. He is my life, abundant life, everlasting life, eternal life. He is, he is. He's the rock in the weary land. He is the Alpha and Omega. Yes, he is. And I can't forget what he's done for me. I can't forget what he's done for me. You can't forget what he's done for you. He snatched me out of Satan's grip. Just like you, I was on my way to hell. But Jesus, just in the nick of time, saved me, spared me, and now therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Talk about me if you want to. Send me to hell if you think you can. But my life is hidden with Christ in God. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Why in the world will I act like I haven't been changed? Why in the world would I think for a moment that I did this? No, in spite of me, I stand before you with this testimony that I'm saved by grace. Through faith in Christ Jesus, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm running on in Jesus' name. Do I have any like-minded people today? Do you know Jesus? He was unknown, but he's not unknown to me now. He's revealed himself to me, and I can't act stupid. I can't be ignorant. I'm going to tell you, and without shame, I'm going to tell you that he loves loves me like he loves you and if anyone calls on the name of Jesus they will be saved I feel like preaching here today but can somebody pause with me right now because I feel like praising God also it's in him I live I move and I have my being come on put a praise on it hey So, 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 so when I think of his goodness and what he's done for me, unapologetically, I can't, I can't hold it. I don't understand you who are so prim and proper that you can hold it. I thank God for the worship team. 
but if the worship team wasn't in the room right now, they can't take my praise. They can't take my worship. And I'm so glad that I know they know that you can't take their worship. You can't take their praise. Uh, I know you said it earlier, but just kind of just look at somebody. Stand, stand, stand face to face and just kind of go like this and say, look at me. You're looking at a miracle. Uh, uh, yeah, tell somebody else you're looking at a miracle. You're, you're, you're looking at a miracle. You're looking at a, at a, at a miracle. Uh, t- 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 tell somebody, I can't tell you my whole story right now. Oh, but I got one. Now, 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 just grab that person, shake them a little bit and say, if you've been through, if you've come through what I've been and come through, you'd be praising them too. Can't be silent, can't be apathetic, can't be religious, can't forget. I got to praise him. I got to praise him. I've got to praise him. We've got to praise him. I'm gonna give you 90 seconds. In him, we live, move, and have our being. Come on, saints.
thank you for watching. I trust that you were blessed by the message. And if indeed you were, would you do me a favor? Do all of us a favor. And I say thank you in advance. Take a moment right now and subscribe to our channel and share. And if in fact the message has blessed you, would you partner with us by sowing a kind and generous seed? Your partnership with us helps us to do what we do and spreading this gospel, good news of the kingdom to people everywhere. Thank you in advance and join us again next time.